Hi, my name is Rob. Today I want to show you how to make your own geared head so you can learn how to operate with hand wheels like a pro. First, let's have a bit of backstory. Unless you work in the film industry, you probably don't realise that geared heads are an important part of creating the cinematic look. They have been around since the early days of cinema and they were originally the only way to operate those massive cameras with ease. The mechanism at the heart of a geared head was adapted from anti-aircraft guns. These faced a similar challenge of keeping a moving target in the crosshairs. You see, pan and tilt are driven by separate wheels, giving the operator complete control of the shot. When electronic remote heads were introduced, they were still operated with hand wheels as opposed to joysticks or any other interface. Fast forward to today and we have stabilised heads with wireless control, along with all manner of tracking vehicles, remote arms and camera cranes. But even with all this modern technology, most of the operators on big movies will still choose to control the camera the old fashioned way. But how does anyone learn this awesome skill? Well, the regular way is to borrow a geared head from a rental house, then move a laser around a target or practice writing your name with the crosshairs. There's nothing wrong with this, but what if you can't borrow a geared head? And what if there was a way to practice on a moving subject? Well, it turns out there is. I want to show you how to make this low-cost geared head that you can use to play any computer game that takes a mouse input. So far this week, I've operated an Apache gunship, I've been hunting sharks with a spear gun, I've shot down enemy aircraft, I've held off a beach invasion, and I've even attempted first-person shooters like Call of Duty and Battlefield. I'm not going to lie, I got pretty annihilated at these last two, but operating under pressure like this certainly makes you learn the wheels quick, and it's also pretty immersive when you're shooting a flat cannon the way it should be done. And if that ain't enough to convince you, well, I've recently discovered spectator mode in certain games, which allows you to move a virtual camera around any ongoing battle. And it's like having a hundred million dollar movie set at your disposal, all without leaving the sofa. So, how does it work? Well, it's based around an old computer mouse. You know, the ones with the grey ball that drives a couple of plastic rollers. As these discs rotate, they pass through a sensor which sends a signal to move the cursor around the screen. So all you need to do is remove the ball, fix it down and connect the rollers with rubber bands to a couple of hand wheels like so. When you plug it in, the computer will do the rest. To play most games, you'll need to relocate these mouse buttons onto the handle so you can click them without taking your hands off the wheel. Okay, so that's the basic idea. For the rest of this video, I'll talk you through the basic steps to make your own. But first of all, let's have a look at the key ingredients. You're going to need a USB ball mouse, some rubber bands, sleeve anchors, the kind used for bolting into concrete, M8 threaded inserts, like you get in flat pack furniture, assorted nuts and washers, assorted screws, some 15mm pipe clips, some stiff plastic, some flexible cable, and some plywood. Some useful tools to have include a heavy duty drill with a hole cutter, a jigsaw and or circular saw, an M8 die for cutting a thread, a drill and driver, soldering iron, a half decent vise and an angle grinder and or hacksaw. Right, let's jump straight in. I've attached some plans detailing all the basic dimensions at the end. Although I've used a circular saw here, you could just as easily do all the carpentry with a jigsaw or handsaw even. Once you've got all your pieces together, it's worth taking the time to mark the screw holes out, then pilot hole and countersink them. And also cut your two slots now as well. It helps at this point to butt all the ends up together using an offcut so your staggered joint ends up nice and flush like this. Once you add the bottom piece, you've got a really solid structure to fix your wheels to. To make the hand wheels themselves, I've used a 4.5 inch hole cutter, you know the kind plumbers use to fit drain pipes through walls. If you're using cheap plywood, the trick here is to start from one side until the centre drill goes right through, then finish the hole from the other side. For the next step, you need to drill two extra holes, 12mm from the edge, starting with the pilot hole. These are for the MA inserts and eventually need to be 11mm in diameter. On the final pass, you'll find the drill tries to chew its way through. Instead, if you run the drill backwards, it will avoid snatching and give a much cleaner finish. Careful when you screw your inserts in, you want to take extra care that they go nice and straight or you end up with a wobbly wheel and nobody wants that. Now you're going to need to make your wheel shafts. These sleeve anchors are designed for fixing things to concrete, but conveniently have this perfect tapered end that keeps the rubber band in place. However, the thread will need extending. Another tip here, rather than trying to clamp the shaft in your vise and ruining the thread, if you use two nuts and lock them together like this, you can then clamp these nuts in the vise and run the thread upwards instead. 
Now run the thread till it's about 12 mil or half an inch from the end. Next we need to mount the wheels so they spin nice and freely. First up, I'm going to show you the poor man's method. If you take the sleeve part of a sleeve anchor and cut a bit off, you can pretty much use it just like that, if you don't mind it rattling like mad. However, you can easily fix this with the cunning use of a drinks can. Cut a strip out, wrap it around the bolt like this, cut off the right amount and then roll it slightly smaller than the sleeve and insert it like this in order to make it a tight fit. Then add a bit of oil, hey presto, you've got yourself a poor man's bush. Put your wheel back on and wait, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, stop, rewind. How about using actual real bearings? Oh my god. I know, crazy, right? Well, if you're willing to spend a few extra quid and you have access to a 22mm auger like this, then let's proceed. Here's another cheeky tip. If you try and cut a recess with an auger like this, it's just going to chew its way through the wood before you can say, oops. So instead, get a scrap piece of wood, screw in a wood screw, and then you make yourself an adjustable end stop until you get the right depth. Of course, if you have access to a pillar drill, then ignore everything I just said and use that instead. The key difference with bearings is that they don't rattle, but this also means they have to be set up dead square or your wheel will be terrible to operate. There's no chance your recess holes are going to be perfectly aligned, so the better option here is to just make a nice collar that sits between the two bearings. If, like me, you don't have access to a lathe, well here's the poor man's version. By holding the file firmly up against the end of the collar as it spins, you can quite easily make the ends perfectly parallel like so. Anyway, the wheel's back on, back to where we were. If your mouse is the same as this one, you're going to need to cut a bit off the end to get it to fit nicely. Then drill holes in all four corners and you're good to go. You'll then need to gently remove the rollers and slip the rubber bands over the end. And seat it on the part of the roller that has the most clear space around it. On some mouse designs, you might need to cut some plastic away here to stop it rubbing. Before fixing it down, you want to run the shaft backwards and forwards like this until it finds a nice comfy zone. Sometimes it will sit right on the end of the taper like this, but they never seem to fall off. The main thing is to watch that they don't start rubbing anywhere. Once it's fixed down, it's time to move on to the buttons. If you haven't done much soldering before, here's a couple of hints to get you going. Removing components from a circuit board can be a total pain in the ass without the right tools. But since there are only three pins on each button, there is a shortcut. All you need to do is to hold your soldering iron across two pins at the same time, going backwards and forwards, and you'll be able to twist the components off like this. Cut yourself three cables and strip back the ends. Next you want to tin the tips, which involves coating them in solder and makes your life a lot easier later on. You want to make sure you heat the copper wire a split second before you dab the solder on, or else the solder will just sit on the surface. Then, to push the tip through the hole in the board, you could spend ages cleaning off the excess solder. However, I prefer to just melt it on the back of the board and push the tip through like this. Word of advice here, this all needs to be done quite quickly. If you keep your soldering iron on the board for too long, the pads might start to lift off. If it doesn't work straight away, just stop, take a breath, let it all cool down, and then try again. Okay, moving on. To attach your buttons to the wheel handles, you'll need three plastic pipe clips. The key here is to make sure the angle you cut is 90 degrees to the angle the button is mounted on. An easy way to do this is to just mount it flush to the top of the vise and use the side of the vise as a guide, making sure to leave a little bit sticking out at the end. You might need to drill the holes of the buttons out to 2.5mm. Next you'll need to mount the body of the button flush to the top and then drill into the plastic with a 2mm drill bit. Whilst you're here, drill a couple of extra holes for the cable tie. Now you're ready to mount the buttons.
Now cut some strips of the stiff plastic and give them a nice rounded end. Mark the hole using the pipe clip and then drill right through. When you do up the nylock, leave it a bit loose. It will require adjusting in a bit. Insert a small cable tie now and then solder the tips of the wires to the pins, making sure you match the position they were mounted onto the board. Since you've already tinned the tips, all you need to do is melt a blob of solder onto the tip of your iron, hold the wire in place and just dab them together quickly and hold until it cools. At this point you might want to spend a bit of time just adjusting the clicker so that it doesn't get stuck and it moves nice and freely. Ok moving on, time to finish the hand wheels. Firstly, chop a bit off the end of the sleeve anchor. This off cut can be used as a bit of stud to mount the counterweight, or you could just use a bolt. Anyway, cut the bit of the sleeve down and cut some pipe to length too. You're also going to need to counterweight the handle to get the wheel to spin nicely. This involves a bit of trial and error. I happen to have a bit of 3mm sheet metal left over to make these, but if you don't have anything like this, you might need to get creative. Assemble the handle and counterweight like so. If you lock the nut against the threaded insert, you should be able to get the handle to spin nicely without too much rattle. Next you want to insert the circuit board and figure out a good place to drill holes for cable ties. This can be a bit fiddly to get all the cables moving nicely and the board seated flush. It's also a good time to double check that all your rubber bands remain in place and you also need to remember to invert the tilt axis like so. As you can see here, I've mounted the third button on a bit of pipe at the side. This can be mapped to certain functions in some games and can even go onto the handle if you want. Likewise, I've put the scroll wheel back in place, which some games allow you to use as an input. That's pretty much everything, so it's time to test it. I've been using a paint program to check everything is running nice and smoothly. You might want to adjust the bands a bit. Too much tension and the plastic rollers start sticking and you get this juddery motion. So you might need to lift the mouse up and put some washers underneath. Each one's going to be a little bit different. The dimensions I've given are just a guide to get you started. And the parts I've used are just what I had in my shed at the time. So I fully expect there to be better alternatives out there. So that's it. Now you should be able to connect your game wheels to just about anything that takes the mouse input. Join the Reddit group r slash homemade geared to share any issues or clever solutions that you've discovered along the way. Thanks for listening. I hope you have fun making your own homemade geared head.